Lord, we cannot understand anything of eternal significance without your Spirit speaking to us and opening our eyes. So we pray for that. We pray for the truth to be known, for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I've, uh, I've really grown to love this book of Esther the more I've got into it the last few weeks. And I hope I'm not in your way too much there, Glynis. Am I? No. Uh, today you can look behind me. Maybe we'll go forward a bit. But uh, yeah, we, we've only just started to get to the good bit, okay? So um, it gets more fascinating in coming weeks as all the parts of the story start to sort of fit together. So um, I hope you can make it long each Sunday, those are the regulars, because um, you really don't want to miss out. So, and, and I hope I can do it justice, so if that's the other <laughs> big question to the, to the puzzle. But if you do happen to miss out, um, I just thought I'd take this opportunity to point out, for those who may not be aware, we have a YouTube channel, and all the messages can be found on there. Um, and they're almost all slideshow videos, so if you, you can watch as well, if you have the time to sit and watch it. Um, but I think it seems that most people just sort of have the messages playing in the background and do something else, and that's, that's cool. So, but that's just what your options are, just so you know. And also before we get to the actual passage today, I just want to address a little bit more about something I talked about last week, which is the whole idea of God and genocide. And uh, it's a, that's a tough question, that. It's a, it's a prickly one. So it's sort of, the, the question is, how can a good God decree the annihilation of a whole group and all their stuff as well? Now, obviously, that's, we're talking about that's happening to the Jews in this, but at other times, God did that back in the, further back in the Old Testament. So in addition to what I said last week, I think it would be just a good idea to keep in our minds what difference Jesus makes. Because what we live in now, this side of the cross, it shows us the difference between law and grace. So the law says you must die. Because we're all sinners, right? So we, we, we must die. Grace says Jesus died in your place. The law says you must pay for your sin. And grace says your sin has been paid for. And summarized, all that stuff is summarized in the cross, the, the grace. So for those who are quick to accuse God of being a monster, um, on, on this point at least, they need to first give him thanks for the fact that they're born this side of the cross. Because that's part of the reason we have trouble grasping why God can do this kind of thing. Because we've only ever lived in the protective shadow of the cross. That's all we've ever known. And life, well, but life under the law is much more scary, literally much more cutthroat. So may we first have that gratitude before we go accusing God of savagery just because we're more familiar with his grace. So that's one thing I just wanted to point out. I mean, my other arguments are from last week. I still stand by those and you can check them out. So yeah, I hope that makes sense and I, I just want your eyes open to that reality of... So we, we see things through slightly rose-coloured glasses, I guess, with the grace of Jesus on the cross there. And again, that's not a full explanation of why God does, does those things, but it's certainly part of it. Okay, so with that now, let's, let's see God's grace as it moves through the Old Testament as well, so through what happens here today in this passage. Because while the cross is the ultimate demonstration of grace... That doesn't mean grace was absent before Jesus came, of course. There's plenty of grace in the Old Testament. And today we see it operating in Esther and Mordecai's lives, despite the threat they're facing and the fact that they simply didn't know exactly what was going to happen. I mean, we sort of read the story and go, oh yeah, that's a nice story, it's interesting, but imagine living it, you don't know what's happening next. So they do have to have a great deal of faith. And we see strong faith in them in, in different ways, in both of Esther and Mordecai. So, so the situation is, for those who haven't been recently, um, the edict is to annihilate the Jews in 11 months' time. It's just been given, as inspired by Haman, the bad guy. Well, not the bad guy, he's the bad guy. <laughs> he's the big villain in the story. So we go to verse 1 of chapter 4, so if you're following along. In your Bible there, verse 1 of chapter 4, When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. All right, that's fair enough. You can understand that, why that would happen. Jews are, well, have, were there, and I think they still are, 
very open with their emotions. It's just what they're like and that's how they mourn. They don't go into their room and quietly weep, which is probably how someone like myself would do it because I'm a bit more of an introvert. They were far more public and they'd you know, basically put on a hessian bag and lay in powdery ash to symbolise the poverty they were feeling at that time, just with the, the fear and the, what was coming on them. So verse 2. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. Now, remember, the king's gate was not just a, a two-dimensional thing. It was a big region where the commerce was all held and all that kind of thing. So th- that was Mordecai's workplace. So his job was in the king's gate, literally in, because it was in that region. It's not just yeah, two-dimensional. So it's where all the, the international merchants came and went from. So, you know, it was a hive of activity. That's, where, that's the king's gate. But today, as in today in the, in the story, which was the 13th of Nisan, just pointing that out. We'll come back to that in a little while. 3 verse 12 tells us that. But today, that day was very different. Since he wasn't, sorry, he was mourning in sackcloth, he wasn't allowed in. So you can't go past the gate if you're in mourning situation. So... You know, they don't want that kind of thing getting in the way of trade and all that stuff. They want to have a, you know, a very positive front, you know, you know, the marketplace and all that. And so, and also the king wouldn't want to hear anything if you're wailing out loud and that kind of thing. So keep him away from that. So that means Mordecai had to hang around the public square in front of the gate. Now, to make you, make you aware of the authenticity of this story, I thought I'd just show you exactly where this all took place. And we know exactly where this took place. Now, I just went on to Google Images, and this is a place called Shush in Iran. Now, in Hebrew, Susa is Shushan, so you can see where the name comes from. Okay? Now, that's, um, th- that's the palace. They've worked it out, and it, I was going all over the internet trying to get a bit more information about, because they've actually worked out where all these things happen in, in great detail. But the best I can tell you is that the King's Gate is there. That was it there. And we understand, you know, I think the throne was about there and Esther's area was maybe around here. So if you can sort of picture that as we go through this story about, you know, Hathak coming back and forwards between the places. So that means uh, Mordecai would have to hang out sort of around here somewhere. So I don't know how long ago Google took that picture, but probably only a year or two, I imagine. So that's the current state. It got excavated in the 18, 1900s. But as soon as the Revo- Revo- Iran revolution in 1979, that all stopped. So that's the state it was left in. So there you go. You can picture the, the, um, that as we go through this. So this really did all happen, and it really did happen right here. And that's the seat of power in the whole Persian Empire, which you know, obviously affected the whole kingdom. So go to verse 3. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there, were great, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes like Mordecai was doing. So Mordecai was first but many of the Jews followed the same custom to express their grief. Now what about Esther? She found out about Mordecai and some general hints I'm sure but she didn't seem to have the full story just yet. So verses 4 and 5 tell us about that. When Esther, Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her about what Mordecai was doing. The queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her and ordered him to go to Mordecai and learn what this was and why it was. So it begins with a, with a conversation between Esther and Mordecai that's carried out by Esther's aide Hathak. Hathak. So Esther was in the palace, as I pointed out before, and she couldn't go, um, or she was sort of, that's her duty, so she was there, and Mordecai couldn't go inside, so poor old Hathak had to go back and forwards. Now, if you think about it now, he kind of had a front row seat to some of the most famous statements in the Bible, so I don't know if he was, obviously wasn't aware of that at the time, but we'll encounter those in a moment. But yeah, so before we get to that part, Esther needs to be brought up to speed exactly what's going on. So off goes Hathak, so verses 6 and 8, 6 to 8. 
So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square in the city of the city in front of the king's gate. So that means he went from the palace in with Esther and he came out to where uh, Mordecai was, verse 7. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction. So all this information is further evidence that Mordecai was a real insider because he was at the king's gate, that was his job. And that's an insider job, kind of. Well, it was a very high influence job. So he was privy to all the high level stuff that was going on, the trading and all the discussions. So not just anyone could get their hands on the written decree because there were no, obviously no printers or photocopiers back then. So you could only, as fast as you could write, that's how many you could get out. So the fact that he had one shows he was you know, pretty high up. And, and he also knew the Queen, didn't he, of course? He knew her very well. And even she didn't know the details. Just kept in the dark a bit. So it was up to Mordecai to tell her. But he didn't tell her just so she could mourn as well. He had an idea. So he sent Hathak back again with the copy of the decree. But most importantly, his idea. So he you know, sent the decree in with, and then his idea. So he gave this to Hathak. Second part of verse 8. That he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and com command her to go to the king to beg his favour and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Now don't you hate those conversations with messengers? He says, well you tell him, da 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 da, and then he goes there and, oh you tell her this and then it uh, <laughs> takes a while. And it kind of reminds me of those conversations you have in primary school with someone, well, in my situation, someone of the opposite sex you might find a bit interesting. Maybe it was just me, but in, I remember in year four I had a conversation like this with, with a nice girl via her friends. And, uh, you know, conversation by proxy. And for my brother's benefit, that was Natalie Shepherdson, all right? So. And um, we started going out that day. This is year four, remember? Um, apparently, even though I never spoke to her after that, so that's that's just my shyness, I think, coming through. But she might might have been a bit similar. I don't know. Anyway, I digress. But it's just these kind of communications are not all that efficient. Um, you know, we're hanging there on the other end. We're waiting for the in between us to do their bit and hopefully bring back an accurate message, which is exactly what Mordecai was doing here. As far as he was concerned, this is the whole plan. This is it. There's nothing else left it's, and it's a long shot. That's what it looks like to him anyway. But what did it look like to God? It was just another, for him, another link in the chain of the deliverance of the Jews and ultimately in the arrival of his son to save sinners. It doesn't matter how skinny that little thread is that's holding up the way of God's plan. If it's God, God's plan, that thread will hold. I'm trying to think if that's the best way of talking about it. But yes, imagine a little thread holding up the plan. It'll hold because it's God's plan. So here it is. Mordecai thinks that, hey, she's the queen. Maybe the king will listen to her. That's, that's about it. That's all he's got. But in those days, there was no guarantee of that. And Esther's reply wasn't very encouraging. Not this time anyway. We look in verse 10 and 11. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death. Okay, now just to sorry, explain at the bottom there, you'll see I've got arrows pointing from Esther and Mordecai. So Mordecai is outside the gate and Esther's inside the palace, so that's the idea. So you know who's talking what at any point, hopefully. But, you know, the whole thing, put to death if you approach the king, is a bit drastic, isn't it? You think at least the queen would get a free pass. But that's not how the ancient Persians saw it, because their king was like a god. And he, he, his right to remain undisturbed was supreme. And what he wanted was as good as gospel for them. Now, I've seen several times through the book that Ahasuerus, also known as Xerxes, for those who aren't familiar, was someone who's pretty happy to delegate his decision making at times, as you've seen plenty of times where he's just taking the advice and yeah, that sounds good, let's run with that. 
But it seems that was just his style more than anything. But it was not the law. Um, sorry. It, it was the law of approaching the king unsummoned that was really, really the strong one here because uh, I guess there was some kind of safety behind that because otherwise anyone could just come up pretending to be nice but they've got a sword behind their back or whatever. Um, so you know, to preserve the king and his peace, the, this law was in place. Now we're actually told by scholars there were six people who were exempt from this law. But I, I'm guessing they'd be all men, those six people, and they'd be you know, his immediate guards and servants and closest male advisors. I didn't look that up, but I, uh, that's, that would make sense, obviously. The, not, the Queen's not one of them, is the point. The only way she could come unannounced and survive would be this way, as we see in verse 11, continued there. Except, to the one, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I've not been called to come into the king these 30 days. So basically she's saying, listen Mordecai, I'm not sure that's going to cut it, your plan. It's been a month since he's even bothered to ask for me. Imagine that, husband and wife. But let alone let me ask him something. That's, that's another step again. And if he happens to be in a bad mood, which he often is, especially where the wars are going at this time, if you remember, um, it won't be getting any golden scepter and it'll be curtains for me. So that, I understand her view there. So when this message gets back to Mordecai, he can read, read those, the, 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 between the lines, you could say, and her, she's wavering there. And just on that point, these would have been verbal messages that the servant Hathak would have been conveying. So you know, tell him this and he had to remember it and tell the other person. He had to get it right because he's dealing with the queen and one of the king's high officials. So his job was to get that message pretty accurate. It wasn't to elaborate on the message from royal authority for his own benefit or put his own slant on the basic message. His job was to accurately present it. And this gets me thinking about our jobs as servant of a far greater royal authority. If you've been coming here for any length of time, you'll notice that I tie myself pretty closely to the passage I preach. And that's not because I don't have anything creative to say, but because I'm keenly aware that a key part of my job is to, as a pastor, is to convey God's words as accurately and faithfully as I possibly can. If I introduce any significant distortion in God's message, I'm also therefore misrepresenting God. And that's just about the worst thing you can do, especially as a pastor. Now, of course, there are some that take this principle too far and never explain the scriptures. There are churches who they just read out the Bible and leave it at that, um, believe it or not. Now, I don't know any of those churches, but they do exist. But the New Testament examples we see are of preachers pretty much explaining the text, or at least making Jesus known, and not giving self-improvement motivational talks. Now, I believe if a pastor preaches the gospel faithfully, that kind of thing happens anyway. Because the gospel is inherently good news. That's what the word means, isn't it? It comes from you know, the um, evangelic, you know, evangelism. Even good word, good news. Or good message. But it's, it's only good news when all the elements are in place and the true Jesus is at the centre and no one else. It's not ourselves or our happiness or our comfort. And certainly not a counterfeit Jesus who is all about to give you your best life now. So we need to, like Hathak and the others with him, so notice verse 12 actually talks about they told Mordecai. So Hathak was obviously the main spokesman, but there was a, a group. So they and we need to be diligent in presenting God's word faithfully. Well, okay, he wasn't presenting God's word, but the word of the authority, obviously. And that's not just for pastors and preachers, all right? All of us need to ask for God's help to increasingly live our lives daily faithfully to him as well. Because the way we live our lives is sometimes the only gospel people ever read. Have you heard that phrase before? Yeah? Sometimes the only chance they will see the, see the truth is through your life. So I could go through a whole thing there, but I'm not going to. It's okay. We'll stick to our story today. So, so back to Mordecai. He, he could see that Esther was a bit dubious about his proposal for her to go to the king. And yeah, I can understand why she's saying that. So 
Then Mordecai, verse 13, told them to reply to Esther. Now this is his big, big push. Do not think that to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. In other words, just, just because you're in the palace, don't think that you're going to avoid this edict. You know, you still, it'll be found out you're a Jew. Someone will dob you in for sure. And as she just said herself, the queen is not above the don't approach the king uninvited rule. So if she's not immune from that rule, she certainly won't be immune from this far broader one. You know, or it's, you know certainly a big deal, this, this edict that's just come out. Now, I want you to pay real good attention to this next bit because I want you to see his faith, Mordecai's faith in this next bit, even though God is not mentioned. Verse 14 is what he says. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish. So can you see the faith in there? Faith in who or what is the question. Faith in God, yes, but also faith in his word. His promises written in the Old Testament. I mean, that's all they had at that time, obviously. And it was still being written, of course, but he would be thinking of the, the Torah. There's promises in there that he's referring to. So he's 100% convinced that God will preserve the Jewish people one way or the other. You can see that's fundamental to what he said, isn't it? He knows this because the promises God had made in his word. For one thing he knows is that the Messiah hasn't come yet. And the Messiah must come or else God is a liar. He said, God's not a liar. The Messiah hasn't come, so somehow the Jews will be preserved. That's his logic there. So Mordecai believed God. It's a bit like how Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. That's Genesis 15, verse 6. That means his faith that God would do what he said allowed his sin and guilt to be replaced by Jesus' holiness and righteous, rightness, righteousness, rightness, before God in his spiritual account, if you can put it that way. So that, there was a, like a transaction that occurred. So Jesus' righteousness, so his right standing before God, even though it was still coming at a later time, was credited to him, to Abraham. And it's the same with us. If we believe God, if we trust what he tells us about Jesus paying for our sin and taking it away, we believe in Jesus, we place our eternal destiny in his hands, then we are credited with his righteousness. And then we are forever in right standing with God. That's not to say we don't still sin sometimes and our relationship with God ebbs and flows. Sometimes we are, you know, sometimes we sort of slip a bit, but simply that we are now his child is the main point. And God will never reject his children eternally. So that's the kind of faith Mordecai shows here. And he knows that Esther has an opportunity before her. And if she doesn't grasp it, it will cost her. So it won't thwart God's overall plan, He'll find someone else to do it, as he says there. Or he'll do it himself, perhaps. But her opportunity to be part of that deliverance will be lost. And don't we, who knows what opportunities we lose because we're not ready to grab onto what God says to us. So, so that's his challenge to Esther. So it's, it's really appealing to her understanding of the big picture. And it's a really powerful challenge. So he brings it home with probably the most famous line in this book, this book of Esther. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. A lot of people who do talks on Esther call it for such a time as this. And let's, let's quickly explore that. And again, you can see Mordecai's fundamental understanding of God's sovereignty, his control over everything here. But as we keep noting, God is not mentioned anywhere in Esther. But can you see how his sovereign plan completely undergirds Mordecai's worldview. If if you're looking, you can see that. Because that last sentence clearly implies at least some kind of overall power at work in all this. And of course, Mordecai attributes this to Yahweh, the one true God. So Mordecai probably looked back at all the intricate events that that brought her here, because we've been talking about them as we've been going through. And, And then to this moment, with his eyes of faith, he saw God's hand at work. 
And with that understanding, he knew that the rest would work out too, as difficult as it might seem in the meantime. And that's great faith. So I'm hoping you can see that faith in Mordecai's response there, and what he said. And that's the message he sent to Esther. So Hathak and his guys head back in again to convey this accurately to Esther. And then I'm sure she had to have some time to think this and pray this through. But not very long, I'm sure, because, you know, time was critical here. But whatever time it took, she now knew what she had to do. Verses 15 to 17. So she was dubious before. Now, here's her response. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. So the arrow's going back out of the building again. So gather all the Jews to be found, or go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So here is the nearest thing to a religious act in this book. So prayer and fasting. Well, we imply the prayer, but again, it's not specifically mentioned, but the fasting is mentioned there. It's almost like the Holy Spirit is editing out any reference to anything relating to God specifically and a relationship with him. Now, some claim this is because the story was written for pagan readers, and that may well be the case, because they were trying to keep it hidden. But whatever the circumstances surrounding its creation, this book still bursts with God's love and providence. That's him taking care of his people, if you're looking. So you've got to be looking for it. And just on fasting, why do you think fasting helps? Because I don't think we get a fair idea these days. of what, What's the point of fasting? So did Esther think that if she got enough fasters working in tandem, working all together, she would build up enough spiritual weight to move God to do something? Is that what fasting does? That doesn't sound right, does it? <laughs> no, it's not how God does things. No, um, not quite to that, to that degree anyway. Um, but I think that's a lot, how a lot of people do see fasting. Now, look how pious I am, Lord, aren't you impressed? But no, it's not like that. It's... Our works themselves do not impress God. We learn that well and truly in the New Testament and the Old Testament. But what God is looking for is a heart open to him in love. And this is the purpose of fasting. So in Esther's case, she, by fasting, she's saying perhaps something like, Lord, I'm reminding myself that I don't need food to be sustained by you. And in this, in this time of fear and danger, I throw myself at your mercy to sustain my strength, but also to sustain my life. And it's a threat in her life here and the life of those I love, which are all in danger. I don't do this to manipulate your hand, but to willingly put aside my desires for this time to focus my heart on you and what you would have from me. So that's some kind of summary about perhaps the purpose of fasting. So you can keep that in mind if you ever consider the act of fasting. It's a worthwhile thing to do. But as for Esther, her self-sacrifice that is part of fasting also comes out in her words there. In the end, you know, if I perish, I perish. Now, that's not fatalism. That's simply saying, God, your will is good, and if you would call me home now, that's okay with me. This is leaving it all in his hands. Now, there are examples of this kind of attitude from believers sometimes in the most terrible situations in the Bible. I'm just going to quote two. One of them is Job. We all mostly know what Job's like. He lost everything, he lost his kids lost his wealth and his health. He was in ashes just like Mordecai. And he said in, verse, in Job 13, verse 15, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Now, that's faith, isn't it? And then there are future believers in the tribulation period the Bible describes for us in the book of Revelation. It's a terrible time, but John writes in 12, verse 11, that they love not their lives even unto death meaning they weren't scared to die because they knew where they were going. Or more precisely, they knew the one they were going to. Because remember, it's always this relational thing. It's not just about going to a place in heaven. It's the fact that God is there. And that we go to see him. So just like them, Job and these tribulation believers, Esther put her fate in God's hands. And of course, 
that's something we all need to do as we as we grow in faith we can increasingly trust god with our whole lives that's what christianity growth is it's handing your life more and more over to him now just to finish off today as a kind of summary um is is something a, a bit cool i think in esther i think it's great now we'll just go through esther a few points on esther firstly esther's people the jews were under the curse of death is that right under the curse of death. And because of this, Esther had agreed to approach the king. So we can work with the idea that from this point on, so from the point that she, of her resp- final response to Mordecai, Esther considers her life lost, in a sense. You know, She's resigned her fate into God's hands, and so in that sense she's dead to herself in her own mind. I hope that makes some kind of sense. As far as she's concerned, there's no more natural life ahead, if, if, if there is none. She's, she's okay with that. And all her plans and her dreams, she's shelved those now and said, okay, I'll take it if that's what you've got for me, Lord. So she considers herself dead, you could say. All right. Now, if there, is there anyone else who could do what Mordecai asked her to do? No? No. Is, was there anyone else with a love relationship with the king like she has? Okay, so, you know, she hadn't been in there for a month, so that kind of love, but, you know, they got married on the basis of love, as the book of Esther tells us. So, no, no one else could fill the role that Mordecai has laid out for her. Okay, so Ahasuerus didn't see her, like I said, very much, but the basic idea is that he was, so she was closest to his heart out of anyone. Okay? So she is the only one who can save her people. She is the only way. Now, do you remember what date the edict was given? I mentioned it before. Who remembers? Sorry? The first month, yep. And the 13th, yes. That's right, 13th of Nisan. So you can look it up in 3 verse 12. It says there, 13th of Nisan. And I mentioned last week that that's the day before Passover. So, yeah, Passover is the 14th of Nisan. That's when the the lambs are slaughtered. At least, they they wouldn't have been probably there, but they would have been back in Israel. um, Because I think, yeah, the temple was up at that stage, yes. So so the point is that this death death would have started at Passover. Because this discussion happens the day before Passover, so she started on Passover. So how many days was she going to fast for? Three. Three days and three nights. That's right. Anyone see where I'm going with this? Yes. <laughs> so here is an intercessor who would in three days rise from her fast and approach the king on behalf of her people. Now, you may have picked up, all this reminds us of someone else. His people, his family were under the curse of death too. And he sacrificed himself for them, but he actually died. And he was the only way, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. And guess what? He died at Passover too. And I would argue that it was on the exact day too. But um, And he was dead for three days and three nights. And at the end of those three days and three nights, he arose and went to intercede to the ultimate king, God, with whom he had a love relationship So when we see all this, obviously, we see that Esther is a picture of Jesus Christ, at least in this particular point. She is a type, you could say, a prefiguration of what Jesus did for us. The rest of her people were powerless and under the, the curse of death, just like we were, but she had the courage to be fearless in the face of the threat to her own life, just like Jesus. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we worship Esther. No, we worship the one that her example points to. That's the whole point of types and, and these kind of things. They point to the main thing. And that's why they're there. It's all about Jesus. So Esther faced physical danger, but Jesus faced far more than that. He faced physical danger, but he faced all kinds of things that we can't even understand, I'm sure. And the cross was the central battle and the ultimate victory for God and his people. And Jesus did it. He's the one we need to focus on. So we need to be, as Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, and we'll finish on this, we need to be looking to Jesus, 
the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So let's keep that in mind. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these um, images in your word that point us to you. And we thank you for the faith shown by Esther and Mordecai to follow you even when things look desperately bad. But Lord, we know that you work your plan through all things and you worked your plan through this and you brought your son into the world and this is a part of that plan. We praise you for that and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.